Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Barbara Blumink, and I think we have a great group today, and a really, certainly in the middle of this art fair and this week, an interesting topic. I think uh, the art market has never brought higher prices, and certainly brought more people interested in collecting art. So we have three experts here, and hopefully they will tell us something about collecting. So, panelists, um, let's start a little bit with the idea of, is it more beneficial, in your opinion, to collect many media in a private collection or to concentrate on just one? And maybe we'll start with Amy. I think it depends on what stage of collecting that you're at. If you're just beginning, then it might be beneficial for you to start with one media. Can you hear me? Um, because there can be a real lack of connoisseurship if you, sp you spread yourself too thin. You should really concentrate on one thing and get to know it very well. Um, if you're a little bit more advanced and you know a little bit more about what you're doing, then maybe it's a better idea to op open yourself up a little bit more to other media. But what about the idea that so many artists now are working in so many media and don't want to be confined to being seen as a sculptor or a painter or a video artist. They're all kind of, I mean, are you finding that, um, do you find that that's difficult if someone wants to say collect Glenn Ligon or someone um, where he will do um, a fluorescent light on one end, or he will do painting, or he will do photography, or just for an example, someone. Um, how do they practice connoisseurship on an artist who will work in so many different areas? Yeah, anybody jump in on that? I think that uh, when you're collecting art, you should basically diversify your collection at all times, especially when you're a first-time collector. And, and why is that? Because by doing that, you're educating yourself eventually to develop a taste in the art world, and you're, you're creating sort of a, a, a thread on what you like to collect. And I think that takes time to do. I think as you're collecting, you know, you gotta go with financially how, what you can afford to buy. So if you're very diverse in your collecting abilities, you're, you're able to, you know, pick up a young artist, pick up an artist that's a little older in, in, you know, the years they've been in business. So diversifying your collection and according to the financial means you have, I think that holds a lot of weight in starting a collection. Now, when you say diversifying, you're talking about, as you just said, a younger, emerging, a more established, but that's not by media necessarily. No. You're talking more according to um, what's riskier or not. No, but I agree with you. You, you, know, you can collect sculpture, photography, and paintings. But in the beginning, you know, going to galleries and realizing what they're selling, what artists they're selling, gives you a better idea of what you like. Because so many times I find beginner collectors, they, they purchase so much because in the beginning they want to have this, they want to, and they end up having a lot of art that two years down the line, it's like drinking a great bottle of wine and an inexpensive bottle of wine. After, you diverse, after your taste changes, you start looking at your art differently. And, and that's a, a, a real question, um, and, and we will get to you, Cheryl. Um, but I'd, I'd love any of you to jump in. Should a beginning collector even consider buying younger work by artists who don't have an established reputation yet? Because that is so much riskier in terms of collecting and the idea of ever reselling it or trading it for something else. I don't think that it's necessarily a bad thing, and it depends on what your, your end goal is. If you're looking at it market-wise, then yes, you may want to uh, take the hand of somebody who's very knowledgeable, a gallerist or a consultant that can help you make good decisions about that. But in the end, you should be buying what you find engaging and interesting, 
And if you are intuitive about that, then I don't think you're going to make really a bad decision. Um, maybe financially, yes, but it's going to be something that you enjoy having. So Cheryl, what do you think about the idea of um, either collecting in depth in one medium or a diverse media in terms of a, building a collection? Um, yeah, I like James think that um, diversifying a collection um, makes it a little bit more interesting and compelling. And um, all collections generally, most collections I should say over time have included cross mediums which, which make it really interesting. Um, you can focus on a movement or a style and see kind of how the characteristics of that style or movement are realized across the different mediums. I find that to be fascinating. Um, and in terms of the younger artists, I've always been one to feel that you should collect what speaks to you and, and what you enjoy. And if you're working with a person who you trust, either a gallerist or um, an advisor, who can kind of help you see if this person is kind of heading in a direction um, that seems like it might end up to be a successful one, then I think you should, you know, go ahead and take that chance. You might not want to spend, you know, 100% of your budget in that way, but you might want to spend 25 or 15% of your budget in that way and have fun with it. Um, well, let's keep on this one question. If one doesn't know something in an area, um, I guess wine, if you've never had wine, and you're introduced to a wine that is very inexpensive, not very refined, um, and that's all you know, you're going to perhaps think that's good. Um, and there's a lot of art that's sold in galleries of, um, and I don't mean to denigrate this in any way, of, of fla bouquets of flowers or sailboats or um, lighthouses that people think of uh, Thomas Kincaid that's very pretty, um, that sells for a great deal of money. Um, and, when, and people love the work. Um, and how do you train a collector or teach a collector that perhaps that when you talk about coming to a place like this and, and that collecting art here might be different from collecting art that they think is just very pretty. This is a really hard question because I know people ask me that and they say, well, I like that. It's pretty. Um, and I'm not sure there is a good answer to this one, but let's see who has to take a chance at that. I don't like the word pretty art, but when you're collecting art, you should educate yourself. I mean, a beginner collector, even a person that collects collectibles, coming to an art fair is essential. You know, art fairs offer us so much more. You're getting to see artists from all over the world and you're getting to see different mediums. But in collecting, you know, learning about the gallery you're buying from, they're going to be a big help to you. Yeah. As, a, as an art gallerist and as, as an uh, advisor to collections, I find myself wearing a, so many different hats, but I approach it as a person that's working for you. You know, if I'm, I'm showing you art, I want you to be very happy with it when you take it home. It's not about selling it to you. It's developing a relationship with you. Because when you're, de when you're developing a relationship with a client, you have to understand every client has their own taste. And each client is going to want something different. One client's going to want something that's very uh, investment-like. One client's going to want something that's very collectible-like. And then you're going to get the client that wants a contemporary artist that they can hang over the couch. And so you, you really got to understand your client and their needs, their preferences, and their financial abilities. Um, well, and, and Cheryl, what do you tell pe collectors who come to you and they say basically, 
why, and, and the art market scares me, um, help me understand why I, I should go with you to an art fair like this in New York City, rather than to uh, a, a little gallery on the corner in my little hometown. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, as James uh, pointed out, that an art fair um, offers kind of a whole array of kind of what's happening at the moment. It's a great cross section if it's a good international fair of um, you know what's prevalent, uh, how people are working, what's what people are selling, what artists are making. And that's all part of the education process. And to kind of broaden uh, their perspective and the idea and help educate the client is, as James, as we all know, is part of what we do. It's, it's part of our jobs. And to kind of break maybe some certain kind of regional or provincial kind of ideas along with the pretty art. Um, and we all sometimes have to kind of um, work within the desires uh, of the client, but at least we can show them things that are kind of pretty, but also might be a little bit more important than others. And by important, I mean, you know, based on the uh, credentials of the artist, the experience of the artist, and the process, process, processes that the artist uses to create the piece. And that will broaden the appreciation well, let's talk for a minute about um, that idea of collecting in a single media or multiple. And I'll start with you, Amy. Because one of the things about working in a single medium and collecting in a single medium is that each one has very different attributes. And if you collect in one area, and we'll talk about each one, sculpture, photography, painting perhaps, um, they have very different things you have to look for and very things you have to be careful of which can very much affect what's considered quality or value. So starting with um, the photography expert here, what are really the things and the attributes when you see a photograph that you think is very powerful, that you love, what should people look for? And, and really, what are the questions that they need to ask other than that perhaps this is by a big name photographer who they recognize and it's a terrific image? This is a huge question. I don't even know where to start with it. Um, photography is a very unique field because there are so many factors that you need to keep in mind when you're buying. It could be just... Um, attracted to an image because it's a striking one, but you really need to keep in mind some important, um, just a, almost a checklist in your mind because there are editions, there are later prints, there's medium and you know, certain photographers worked across um, color prints, digital work, black and white. I mean, there are so many different media within that. Um, and one of the most important things right now that I'm finding are collectors buying later prints of very well-known images and then not understanding the value for that and how it can differ from a vintage print, for example. So here's where it's really important to educate yourself before you go out or again, find a reputable dealer that can coach you into understanding these nuances because it's very easy to get burnt when you're buying photography. As I remember, um, was it Ansel Adams who um, early on was printing many, many, many examples of his prints until, was it a gallerist or someone who explained to him that in order to raise the value of his work, um, he had to limit the number of prints, and that was called the edition number, so that there were only a limited number of copies. Um, and that's one of the things that it, it, certainly with etchings and lithographs or any works on paper that are so-called editions, um, and especially photographs, you have to look and see how many in the edition and make sure there aren't 500 or 700 
because uh, that means there are an awful lot out there, and if it's four in the edition, that's a heck of a lot better. Right. Uh, that's a really good point, because there are a lot of artists that are just working in open editions, and there's nothing wrong with that, but if you're thinking about it in terms of an, an investment, or really being concerned about the value of that item, then this is something you need to keep in mind when you're putting money down on something like that. Well, I know initially I was very attracted to a contemporary Chinese artist, um, and it was a beautiful work. Um, and in fact, I, it was shown in, I think, Larry Rinder's exhibition at the Whitney when um, there were about four of them and they were really terrific. So I went to the dealer and asked, you know, how much it was. And I didn't ask initially um, how large was the edition. And then finally, when I was ready to buy it, I remembered, oh yes, I should ask the edition number. And apparently at the time, this was early when they were starting to look at contemporary Chinese photography, um, the Chinese at the time weren't limiting the editions. So I learned my lesson and didn't buy it. But um, you, you do have to be careful of that. And I almost was an idiot. And then one other question with photography, um, I think there's another thing that's interesting going on. I won't mention the site, but a lot of sales people are buying now online at Arta Auctions. And I bid on, um, I'll just say, Marilyn Minter, a wonderful um, artist photographer with these great stiletto heels behind rain. Um, and I think she's going to have a big show going around the country. And I loved her work, and this was a great big work. And um, it said that it was signed, and it, it said that it was mounted um, on kind of a aluminum resin. And I paid for it online. And then you go and you pick it up. And when I went to pick it up at the, per the owner's house, I got there and they brought it down for me um, and I had blankets to take it home in a taxi. And I looked at it and first of all, it was on paper, framed, not mounted. And secondly, I looked and it wasn't signed. Um, so I called the online auction house again and I said, you know, I'm not gonna accept it. And one of the things is they had to take it back. So um, another caveat in terms of collecting, especially when you don't see the work in person, is um, to make sure before you take it home that you do see it in person. And especially with things, I think, like photography and works on paper, because um, it was quite a bit of money. So. Yeah, it's a huge issue now with the online auction houses because when you don't see something in person, you're, you're really making a lot of assumptions about what, what other people's ideas are about what good condition means is different from, you know, what I consider good condition is different from what you think. So it can say that, but then when you get it, it's got a big, you know, hump <laughs> taken out of the corner. I mean, kind of good condition. <laughs> so you, I, you really do need to set eyes on what you're buying. Um, that is, you can still buy things from auction, but I would rec recommend sending someone to look at for you if you're not in the area. You can always do that. Or if you have um, a trusted person in the specialist department, they can look at it for you and you know coach you over the phone. So. Yeah, I know a lot of people. I know when I worked at Sotheby's, a lot of people. Um, would send someone to look at it, or they'd ask us to do condition reports that we had to stand by, um, which seemed a little bit better than on the phone. Um, okay, well, let's, uh, Cheryl, um, I know you have a real specialization in sculpture, yeah. um, along with all of you doing lots of things, lots of different media. So what is some of the things that someone interested in buying contemporary sculpture today should look at and make sure that they ask about before just buying a piece? Well, there's three um, primary elements to all three-dimensional work, and this runs through whatever style or category of art that it is, which is too long to discuss here. I mean, you would have to kind of hone in on what 
kind of style or movement that you're interested in. But there's three basic elements um, that are common among all three-dimensional work. Uh, that would be material, process, and display. And um, they're all kind of interrelated in a way, and they're all important because they affect the work in its entirety on several different levels. Um, so for example, materials. Um, there's such an array of materials out there, especially today, which is nice to see on one hand, but can be kind of daunting on the other. So there's more traditional materials, uh, stone, metals, wood, um, marble. And then you have uh, materials uh, today that are more synthetic, resins, uh, plastics, and found objects, and fabric, and cross, um, cross medium um, assemblages, which are also three-dimensional. So it's important to kind of look around and see uh, which medium speaks to you, because I feel as though the medium really kind of sets the visual character of the piece. Um, and then, of course, um, the process is quite important. Uh, to understand the process and how the piece was created helps to give you a uh, better understanding and appreciation um, of the piece and also of the artist's um, craftsmanship and creative process. So when an artist um, makes choices about how to manipulate the material, that becomes part of his aesthetic and his craftsmanship. Um, in addition to the material and the process, um, those, those two elements uh, affect price as well because there are certain materials um, that are quite expensive, like bronze and, and marbles. And then there are other materials that are less expensive, like some plastics and found objects. So price is related uh, as well to the material. Um, now, uh, one thing though, Cheryl, um, bronze sculpture often comes in additions as well, just like photography. So how does that work? Yes, um, I was actually, thanks for mentioning that. That's. Um, a very large part of, of sculpture, and it, and it has been um, throughout the history of sculpture. And it's, um, it's acceptable and, and quite the norm often for uh, sculptors to bring uh, maquettes uh, into a foundry to either be fabricated on a larger scale or to be cast uh, and cast into additions. Um, and even when an artist does this, they still have a certain amount of say or involvement in the process. So when I say learning about the process, I think this is one of the factors. Um, learn about how much um, the artist has put his own hands into the work and how involved the artist is. Um, and then, of course, you have artists who are I champion actually and most of the artists in my program uh, make their own work in their studio um, even large-scale work so they are cutting welding grinding molding um, by themselves to create um, all different sizes of works but then of course you have sculptors like Donald Judd who kind of made a drawing but never yes. really touch the final yeah. sculptures. Well, yes, this is true. And I guess a, to a certain degree, it depends on the, the career and, and, and the point uh, in the career at which the artist you know, is. And it becomes more acceptable with artists who um, are more established and have um, you know, made their own work before. And then they get into more of like a, a designing stage. But the thing that... Um, should be um, taken into account is when you're buying something to ask if it's an original piece or if it's an addition because that will definitely affect the price um, as it should. One of the things um, I wonder about and, and I think none of us have an answer and um, is what about the fact that many and the artists now, the younger artists, um, are making three-dimensional works and in, in some cases, photographic works as well, using scotch tape 
and all, um, with really ephemeral materials, yes. uh, cardboard and scotch tape and food. string and food, <laughs> um, that is simply not going to last, and yet some of it's pretty costly. Um, and, um, and then there are also funny stories about material. I know a number of years ago, there was a large Robert Morris felt work in an exhibition that was just like a large piece of felt on the floor. And at the end of the exhibition, while things were being moved out, a couple of the workmen thought the piece of felt was just some packing material and threw it away. Um, and we're talking about a very expensive piece of sculpture and the artist refused to make another version of it, so it was yeah. entirely gone. Wow. Um, so, you know, how do we now advise collectors when artists are making work that isn't going to last with time? Well, yeah, that's becoming more prevalent. And sometimes, you know, the intention of the work is to actually see it kind of deteriorate and disappear. So. From my standpoint, and I think it's an opinion question, that kind of work is more performance, um, installation performance, um, and that has you know, some value to it on one level, but I feel it's, um, it's a different sort of collecting and it's a different sensibility completely. Okay, Jane, let's, let's bring you in on, on painting because I know you're an expert in a lot of different areas, but because that's an area that many people collect, and um, you're the third panelist. So what, what should people, when they're looking at a contemporary, everybody's doing painting now and not necessarily doing using paint, but when they're interested in a two-dimensional work with some kind of medium applied to it, um, what should they look for, ask the gallerist about before purchasing it? Well, when you're purchasing a two-dimensional work, you have to understand that there's acrylic, there's watercolor, there's oil. So when you're purchasing the work, if you know the difference between those three, because each one requires a certain care. One you wouldn't put in light, one can live in light. And when purchasing it, if you understand the medium and you understand you know, the conditions you're gonna hang it in, then it gives you a better chance of preserving that work of art for a longer period of time. And depending on, you know. The and explain, because the same thing is true with photography or sculpture made of wood or fabric. As a museum person um, advising museums, I know there was a museum in Israel um, that I was advising and the architect had never designed a museum before and the main gallery, he wanted a big open window in the ceiling. And I had to tell him certain materials you couldn't even put in the room because they couldn't have the natural light. So uh, tell a little bit about the differences between oil, acrylic, watercolor, and how they'd be affected by light. Well, today we have UV plexi, and you know, you, you'll notice on certain works of art in museums, uh, even though it's a painting, they'll have this UV plexi in front of it, and it's for the protection of the piece. Even museums are concerned about light on works of art. and. You know, when you're in a museum, you realize that the new museums now have skylights and they have this natural light pouring in because it's not just about the art nowadays, it's about the, the architectural understanding of how the audience flows through a museum and how they, you know, embrace a collection of art in a museum. So, you know, watercolor, you, you can have that just about anywhere. Uh, acrylic you gotta be very careful with because it will dry and it will crack and oil will crack also. So my best advice is keep your paintings, no matter what medium they are, out of that direct sunshine. Even indirect sunshine can hurt them. So, you know, one is not better than the other. I remember years ago, um, 
when I, years and years ago when I was with Sotheby's and they didn't have some of these special um, ways to keep light and other materials from affecting the surface of things like paintings. Um, all the paintings that we went to appraise in the Los Angeles area, and everybody was smoking at the time, um, when you sort of rub the surface um, with any kind of a material to look beyond the old varnish, when you took it off and you smelled your fingers, it smelled like tobacco, because the tobacco had gathered on the surface and actually browned the varnish. So you'd be amazed at how things do affect um, the surface of, of paintings. They're actually living creatures. And, and so often with photography, you go into someone's home, um, your own family pictures where you've had them exposed to light for years and they're no longer the same color they were. They're all faded out and that's because photography, the paper can't be exposed to natural light. So that's a real issue. Um, how do you help people understand in a single artist work when it's a good example in any of these media and when it's, you know, every artist has a bad day. There are great Renoirs and at the end of his life, Renoir, I can say this as an art historian, Renoir painted dozens of fat, really bad naked women. I mean, there are so many on the market and they're terrible. So, you know, we all have bad days doing everything. How do you, when museums and most art shows show the best they can, the best they have of an artist, how do you really train collectors and show them how to train their eye on what's the best? Well, with any medium, whether it's photography, sculpture, or paintings, uh, depending on what category you're buying in, whether it's the contemporary, the collectible, or the investment. But when it comes to purchasing art, as you're talking about, investment art, you know, you should have an advisor, you should have a curator. Uh, when you're spending a million plus dollars, you want to know the authenticity is right, you want to know the provenance is right. There's all these factors that play in uh, making a decision because if one of the three is not right then you question whether I'm going to spend that million dollars and I put some major collections together and had clients say James I want that piece I don't care and I advised them that there's something wrong in one of those areas and if they purchase it it's at their own risk because at the end of the day, when you make a purchase of any art, we do not own the art we buy. We're the caretakers of it. And it's going to be passed on to either your family members or it's going to be donated to museums. Whatever you're doing with that art, you have to realize there's got to be an exit strategy. Because, you know, we hold on to art like, you know, we're going to, it, we're going to keep it forever. And it, there's no forever. So understanding that and understanding the value of what you own because you really love what you own then it gives you an idea of you know how to deal with the end result you're going to put it up for auction you're going to leave it to your children or you're just going to sell it and enjoy the next five years of your life in a really great way but that's assuming you have bought something that's gained in value um, not everything will go up. Even artists who have a great moment um, then disappear. Um, and, and I guess if each of you will answer, um, have you had a situation with a collector 
where they've come to you, um, where not necessarily you advise them to buy something, because that's not fair, but where they've come to you and they've bought something at an art fair or on someone else's advice, or because an artist was hot um, in the media, and they want to sell it, and currently the artist simply has no sales value and they don't know, you know, what do they do with it? Hey, me. <laughs> I need to borrow your mic. Um, uh, this is actually something that comes up on a nearly daily basis at my job. Um, there are a couple of artists in particular that really their prices haven't changed for the last 10 years, 15, 20 years. Um, so speaking about appreciation, there's, there's just nothing really there. It's going to be the same. The worst is when the price has actually gone down because taste change or the condition has changed or just the market in general for a particular artist has shifted. Um, it's really bad news to give to someone, but um, I think my bedside manner is getting a little bit better. Um, but also there's just, um, there's different things to consider when you're thinking about price. If you bought something on a retail market, the fair market value of what I'm giving you at an auction house is going to be different anyway. So it's good to understand those issues about price when you're beginning buying different media too because there are many different factors there. But okay, but I want to know um, Cheryl, what happened, where do you, what do you, what do you tell them to do with the work? They have something, they've gone to the auction house, they've gone back to the gallery they bought it from yeah. and neither one wants it. Well, I mean, before I get to that step, and this actually comes up for me a little bit in things other than sculpture as well, since I have clients that have other types of artwork in their collections, um, I did not necessarily sell it to them, but the questions come up and they ask. And what I first try to do is kind of explain as much as possible um, what's happened to that market. and. I don't know if I do a great job at it, but at least there's resources out there um, such as Artnet and other kind of price databases and other um, companies that will kind of track the uh, monetary um, history, if you will, of the artist's work. And it can draw a picture of you know certain styles of the artist. Um, have not done as well as others, or certain periods of time. So it just, what it does really is provide information. And I think people, um, maybe it's not exactly the answer they want to hear, but with a little bit of an explanation and a rationale to maybe, and showing people, you know, physically, why, you know, on paper, um, this is how this market is going. Um, and maybe tracing that to the larger collecting category and do a comparable uh, you know, research there, you can come up with some explanations that will help them understand. I don't know if that's necessarily going to make them feel better, but at least they understand that there, there may be a reason you know, and a rhyme, and there, there may be like tendencies that they can see. So I think um, education, again, um, can kind of help alleviate um, some of the uh, discomfort when that arises. I generally tell them to kind of hold on to it or give it to their children. <laughs> That's a very good question. And the, the reason it's a very good question is because every five or 10 years, the art world reinvents itself. And if one out of 100 artists really really make it. And, uh, and what I mean by that is they go into the million dollar bracket. But in that process, you know, as an art advisor, a gallerist, what we're doing is we're saying to our collectors, review all the information, you know, because I, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't say to you, today you're buying this for a thousand dollars, 10 years from now it's going to be worth 10,000, 20 years from now it's going to be worth a hundred thousand. So, you know, it, it's really up to the person that's making the purchase to understand that, you know, we as uh, professionals are going to give you all the facts and then you make the final decision. 
And when when individuals call me and say, I bought this piece of art from such and such gallery, and they won't take it back. And I said, and I, and honestly, I, why would they take it back? They were selling that artist five years ago. That artist went elsewhere and he's working with other galleries and there's no reason for them to take it back. But some artist galleries will take back because the value has gone up. It's, a, it's sort of what you were talking about. If you're, if you're tasting uh, one artist, there's times an artist really hits it. Out of 10 paintings, he hits that home run or she hits that home run and everyone wants that piece. Uh, Picasso's blue period. I, I need to have one of the blue period pieces. So it's true. It, art is like fashion in some way. Today it's really desirable and tomorrow it's not so desirable, but you gotta understand that's the problem with collecting. Educate yourself. Understand what you like. You may be living with it for a very long time. <laughs> Well, going back to eclectic collecting, which is sort of what the title was, what are some of the most bizarre collection that you have come across? Especially you, James. Bizarre? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting collections. Like Pez containers, which I've seen. Yeah, I, that you've been asked. Have you have you come across any strange ones? Because people really, I mean, one of the things that I think is fascinating that I found there is a certain personality type of an obsessive collector who um, falls in love with something, and a very many art collectors are obsessive collectors who live and to collect and when they see something they fall in love with cannot not have it no matter what it takes well you know i there was at one time it was called candy in the corner and you can you can look at it and you can you would say but that's wrapped candy and it's in a corner and it's a million dollars. And, yeah, it, and Taurus, people right. turn around and go, why is that a million dollars? And the gallerist said to the potential buyer, it's a million dollars because it's by a certain artist. Right. And, and then the gallerist said to the individual, do you realize you can pick up this candy, unwrap it and eat it and then replace it. Right. And replace it with another piece of candy. So bizarre. And that artist bizarre. became uh, represented the United States in the Venice Biennale. Thank you. Um, not very long ago, a couple years ago. So uh, Candy in the there corner. you go, right? And also sheets of paper that you could pick up one and take it away and, and very other ephemeral things. And he's now got a line of light bulbs hanging down in the new Whitney staircase. So, Is that bizarre enough? No, he, I like him, but anyway. Um, and another question. A uh, major Picasso just sold for a hundred and seventy six million dollars. Um, do you think a single work of art is worth that much? And we'll start with you, Amy. Uh, that, that again is an extremely complicated question because it comes down to taste and what two people are willing to pay for something. That's the auction world. Um, it's whether or not I think that it's worth that is irrelevant. It's what these two other people wanted for that. And that's the amazing thing about the art market. Um, it can be very, uh, how should I put this? Complicated, it can be funny, it can be um, fickle from, from day to day. And that's one of the reasons why I find it so fascinating. Anybody else want to come in on this? Um, I'm, I'm really not. Uh, again, um, it's a personal choice, and there are a lot of people out there, like you said, that are kind of obsessive, and, you know, collectors. They, they just have to have something for whatever reason. If it's a power play, if it's an, 
you know, as an, an aesthetic desire. But, you know, that's the way the auction market works. If there's somebody willing to pay for it and what they're willing to pay for it, um, that's, that's how it works. So, um, yeah, I guess when that happens, it's good for the auction house. <laughs> I personally think it's wonderful. You know, why? why? Because it got a lot of attention. It went global and it gives artists an understanding that one day if they continue their careers that you know who knows now the 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 value of the work to the average person is a lot of money to the people that were buying it it's not a lot of money so you know it depends on your financial abilities but i i thought it was a headline that i enjoyed and uh I shook my head at like everyone else. Now, um, having been the director of the Guggenheim Hermitage in Las Vegas, um, one of the other neighboring museums was Steve Wynn's art collection, and he would famously buy multi-million dollar Picassos and paintings. And um, Many of us felt there's a rule, according to the United States government, that if you buy a painting and you put it up for more than 20 hours open to the public, you don't pay taxes on it. And many of us had a very strange feeling that that's one reason why all of his very, very, very expensive paintings were suddenly on view for 20 to 30 hours a week. So there are other reasons sometimes, not saying this particularly, that sometimes paintings can go for that much money too, that aren't necessarily just for the love of the paintings.